Yeah. I sold the Beetle. It, it was a stupid decision. Not financially. Actually, financially, it was a very good decision and it helped me in the long run. However, it was a stupid decision because I loved that car. That car was, um, I don't know, I, I can't really explain it. Because I had put uh, so much effort into it, and really, it wasn't a full restoration, but it was a restoration as far as, um, as, far as I'm concerned. Uh, a barn fine, restoring it back to on-the-road safety. So really a lot of my my heart went into that car and and uh fortunately the gentleman who purchased it um I I had first off I had received many many messages from people wanting to buy it and a lot of people actually recognized the car from my YouTube channel so shout out to those people that's pretty cool um but most of the people that were messaging me. Um, they either didn't know much about the car, they didn't know much about Beatles, um, or they were looking for a prop, uh, you know, something that they could park at their flower shop for advertisement. Uh, but no one really ever came through. No one ever wanted to come see the car. This gentleman, on the other hand, uh, he was sending me pictures of his collection of vintage VWs. He owned things. He owned Beatles, buses, like he owns a ton of stuff and he owns a concrete business. So he said that he wanted to use it for his concrete business, just going to sales calls. Now I live here in Niagara Falls. He came, um, I'm trying to remember where it was from, but it was, it was up North somewhere. I'll, I'll probably see it. You'll, you'll see it up here somewhere, maybe. Uh, but he drove from my house to his location, which was about maybe a two, two and a half hour drive uh, in the Beetle. And he loved it. He, he said it drove amazing. Um, he keeps texting me every once in a while of, you know, things he's done with the car, things he found with it. And just giving me little updates, which I, I truly appreciate. And especially that he was a, a VW nut. He really appreciated the car. He was very adamant he wanted the car. So um, I'm, I'm glad that it went to somebody who can appreciate it as much as I did. Yes, I did sell the Beetle. Like I said, that was a bit of a stupid decision, but I replaced it with this 2003 Volkswagen GTI VR6 with the 2.8 liter double overhead cam, 24 valve, beautiful, beautiful machine. These things are so much fun. And there's another Volkswagen, guys. Look at that. Bye. Anyways, yes, this is my new GTI. I say new, but I've almost had it for two years now. I've just never really done a proper reveal. Now, uh, this thing is great and all, but there's something about the Beetle. Um, you know, the, the flat four, that, there's something about that engine and how they drive. I just did a bad thing, but I'll get back to that later. So yes, this car, my 03 Mark IV GTI, is pretty awesome. It's been wrapped. I did this wrap myself. It is a very similar color underneath. Let me just get in here. As you can see, it's a very similar color underneath. I got the GTI Recaros. I'm in the process of redoing the headliner because it sagged. It's got 246,000 kilometers on it, which is a little high, but not too, too bad. Starts up like a dream. And you know what else? Yeah, okay, it says service now. That's fine. I need to do an oil change. Uh, still in a bit. But you know what sounds really good? 
the stinking VR6. I mean, one would almost say that I love this car, and I do, it is great. I have put uh, probably almost 20,000 kilometers on it already, and it has not really given me, given me any issues. Even though the previous owner was a bit of a hack, there were a few different things that I had to fix. Uh, namely, engine mounts. I had to replace one engine mount because the bolt had completely snapped. Um, what else did I have to fix? Oh yeah, the dog bone mount, uh, or the tranny mount, whatever you wanna call it, a bolt had snapped as well while I was on the highway. How does that happen? I don't know. But anyways, that's all been fixed. I think I had to do a wheel bearing as well, but nothing, nothing crazy in two years. It's been great. But in typical Mark IV fashion, we have rot. Yeah, this fender I replaced when I first got the car, uh, and that was one of the reasons why I wrapped it as well. Um, but yeah, this, this fender has completely rotted through. And not only that, when you open up the door, you see this, which, I don't know, might be all right. It's pretty crusty. So. So I know you guys are wondering, Miguel, what are you guys gonna do? What are you going, you guys, I act as if it's more than one person. No, it's just me. So I got something weird on my arm. Forget the grease, that's from work. But I know you guys are thinking, Miguel, what are you gonna do? This is a beautiful car. This is what I'm going to do. I stuck them on a paperback. Residue of left in the exhaust. Here we go. And it's looking before, but it's obviously pushing oil. So I just got a notification that the car that I ordered has actually been sold. Uh, apparently there was an issue with the database uh, that it wasn't updated. So unfortunately, uh, that one has been sold. So I scrapped that idea. I'm going to have to keep looking here. Keep you guys updated. So I have been through five or six different JDM cars right now. And I'm trying to buy each and every one of them. But they all fall through. Right now, it is a toss up between two. Two that I know, or I'm being told, are available. So many choices. Well, let's see what happens. I'm waiting for an email from uh, my importer. I, yeah, like I said, I've gone through so many and to me, they were great. The last one, it was a dark blue. It looked great, uh, but the paint was faded and there were scratches and dents all over it. So I thought it was gonna go for a lot less money and it turns out it didn't. So um, I'm shocked. I never thought it would be this difficult to find the proper car. So um, I'm just waiting for an email now. Hopefully he gets back to me in a relatively short period of time and I will update you. This is a magical journey. All right, so I just got an email. Uh, looks like one vehicle is available, one of my choices. And uh, we've agreed on a price and I've sent him an email saying, let's lock it in. So. We'll see if he comes back if it's still available, but here's to hoping.
Three months, Joanne. Three months. It does exist. Yes. You had no faith in me, did you? <laughs> it actually exists. He's not paying attention. <clears throat> How's it going? Good. Yeah, you can drop it here if you want. I'll bring it around. I'll bring it around and I'll park it inside the shop. Okay, perfect. So here it is. My 2002 or BE5 B4 Subaru Legacy RSK, freshly imported from Japan, purrs like a kitten. Kind of hard to hear, but it's got the nice Subi rumble on it. Only thing that was really of concern was this little bit of fading here on the spoiler but the licensing went fine. The only thing I had to do was put tires on it and I'm gonna need to put brakes on it too. Not a big deal. I am going to have to get it tuned uh, for our fuel here because these things are tuned from factory for 100 RON octane. These twin turbos, they, they need a little more octane. So I've been having a little bit of problems uh, with the Mass airflow sensor, I replaced it with a genuine mass airflow sensor, but I am still having some secondary boost issues. It does seem to be getting better. I kind of replace this, I do that, I adjust this, and it seems to, uh, to have an effect. So, awesome, awesome car. Got the beautiful leather wrapped Momo steering wheel. It only has 167,000 kilometers, which is pretty, pretty low even for a Subaru. Uh, I was able to install my radio in here, kind of just temporarily. Uh, I gotta, I gotta do something there. Uh, I got my Cobb shift knob. Now this, if for anyone who may have been following my channel for a long time, this was the same shift knob that I had in my STI. This also has, it looks like this is a Subaru OEM, I don't know. It's not really wanting to focus. There we are. A Subaru OEM um, carbon fiber parking brake handle. Now, I don't really know much about it, but the JDM stuff always had uh, had some cool features. We got the, the digital HVAC, beautiful gauges. This, this car is awesome. I got the fog lights, the auto, not auto leveling, but the leveling headlights. We got a turbo timer. We got the STI. These are, these are pedal covers. I do not believe that these are standard, um, but yeah, they're, they're pretty cool. I might take them off just because it seems that, if you listen, I'm gonna zoom in here. When, when going over bumps, you do get a little bit of noise because that clutch pedal is so heavy. So let's see if I can take you guys for a little drive here. Let's go widescreen. All right, let's see if that works. Now keep in mind, because the mass airflow sensor is unplugged, I am having some issues with the, um, with how it runs, but it seems to, to run very, very well. Now, a lot of people are asking me, what is it like to drive right-hand drive 
uh, when every single vehicle out there is left-hand drive. Well, I tell you, it's not very difficult. You get used to it really, really quickly. The thing that I had the issue with was looking at the rear view mirror and the stocks here. So your blinker stock is actually on the opposite side. It's where your uh, wipers would usually be. So that just takes a little bit of getting used to. If you know that you have to be at a certain point in the road, you're not gonna have a hard time. So let's just open it a bit. There's a second turbo. This thing, this thing hauls. It's very, very quick. There's a second turbo. And that, that you get used to as well, just trying to do the power shifts. But you get that low end from the primary turbo. And then once the secondary turbo opens up, man alive, you are just soaring. Now I wanted to make a video because the RSK was not exactly a widely known vehicle. If you look up on YouTube, the Subaru RSK, you're not gonna get a lot of information. Um, and I don't really know why. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm gonna edit that out. Uh, I don't really know why, because the uh, the RSK, like this is a beautiful cruising car. It's so comfortable at, um, you know, cruising around town doing 80, <laughs> 80 kilometers an hour. Uh, but when you really want to open up the taps, there's plenty of power there. It has Bilstein B4 suspension on it, stock, uh, which is very, very comfortable. And this, it just, it soars, man. Like that's, this thing is fast. Because you don't expect it, it's a heavy car. Um, it, just, it runs so great. Now, uh, like I said, because these things are tuned for 100 Ron Octane, um, you do have to be very, very careful when you're importing one of these into Canada. I don't know if these are quite available yet in the States, but if and when they become available to everyone, just keep notice that um, you do have to get these things tuned for our fuel. We have, here in Canada, we have um, a maximum up to 94, at least in our area. Uh, I'm in the, uh, the GTA, so at least in our area, we have 94 AKI, which, if I'm not mistaken, works out to about 95 or 96 Ron. Um, and that's really, it's still too far away it's basically like putting um, 87 or regular octane in a Volkswagen GTI. You just don't do it. You're not going to get uh, the results that you want. It's going to be pinging. Uh, you're probably going to be getting a little bit of knock. It's going to be retarding timing. So um, that's really where you're going to have some issues with this. So uh, I'm going to be sending out my ECU probably come... Uh, come the winter time, I'm gonna find a little winter beater. Uh, I'm gonna rebuild the black box of death in this thing and all the, the vacuum hoses. Uh, and then I'm gonna send out the ECU for a tune. Um, company out in Richmond, BC called Project Lambda. Um, they are experienced in tuning these, the revision A through Ds, I believe it is. And you do gain a little bit of power. Most importantly, you get rid of that or you reduce that valley of death, which is the switch over between the primary and the, um, the secondary turbo. So yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. And I have some visitors here at my house. Turbo timer. That's always a fun one to get used to. Got to make sure it's not in gear. Now that's all fine and dandy. 
But what's it like actually owning a JDM car that we never got in Canada or in your country? Well, sometimes you deal with problems that because of a lack of information in this country, you have a really hard time trying to fix it. Now, I do have some repair manuals and I have some documentation. I also have a cat right here that just has to be in my face all the time. I do have some documentation. Um, really, I, I'm kind of going in blind. So I'm having an issue right now and I'm going to show you just some of just some of what I've been through to fix this issue. Now I've smoked it, I've looked for leaks, I've checked wiring, I've done the normal things that you would do. But here's a look at some of the frustrations that you have when dealing with a JDM car. Hence why I went out and I just bought myself a new Mark 7 GTI because I want something reliable to just jump in and go. So here we go. So I've got the Legacy here today, the B4, and my Mark 7 GTI Autobahn. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, just gonna be doing a little bit of work on the Legacy today. I have a new intercooler for it. It looks like the um, switchover valve is leaking a little bit and I have I've been having a little bit of boost issues with it so let's take a look let me show you what I'm looking at here come on you know you want to it's a brand new battery too there we go Here is the intercooler on the twin turbo two liter. Um, I initially thought that this was leaking, but this seems to be okay. Um, we have the pipe here going from the first or the primary turbo that goes into the uh, that switchover valve. And then we have the secondary turbo here and you can't really see the charge pipe. Uh, Actually, it is right there where that windy clamp is there. So really easy to pull this off. Um, loosen these two clamps, one, two bolts, and then with a really long screwdriver, you're going to want to undo those two clamps. Nice and easy. So grab your 12 mil ratchet. I just have it on a small extension just to make it easier. Now these, if you thought that the single turbo intercooler was tricky to get out, this is even trickier. Um, I mean, to, to get back on because this coupler is actually a pain in the butt. Now I ordered a new one off of uh, Cobb and of course the uh, this coupler is different. It's on a slightly different angle. I pointed you guys in the wrong direction where that other one was, sorry about that. And see, if you look in here, I'll show you why I'm replacing the intercooler. See all that oil on the switchover valve? I think that's where I'm getting a boost leak from, so you'll be able to see it better once I get this all removed. And I know I don't have any of my tools here from work. This would make this job a million times quicker. So I already replaced the black box of death. I um, 
had a little bit of an issue with it. What happened, I pulled it all apart. I re redid all the hoses inside. I put in new check valves, but little did I know that they were not check. These are not check valves. They're these little bad boys, which, um, Oh no, these ones are check valves, but different pressure. So because I'm a Volkswagen mechanic, um, the Mark IV diesels used to have these little check valves in them. So I ordered two new check valves, put them in, didn't work properly. So I thought I had screwed the whole thing up. I ordered a new black box, which is what you're seeing here. This is the new black box. Um, put the new, uh, the new check valves that I had because I didn't know if they were good or bad. I tried cleaning them out. They're still very hard to blow through, but um, I put the, uh, so with the new check valves on it, they were, it was doing the same thing with the new black box. I put the old check valves on and they, it was working fine. So there you go. So then just undo this little hose holder. And we do have a couple of hoses. Uh, one, you know what, we'll see it once we get this out. I'm gonna go and grab a screwdriver so we can get all these loosened. Then you got that one right down there. And that's loose. And then this one's tricky to see. all the way down in the nether regions. <laughs> I have a nice long screwdriver that would have worked so perfectly for this at work. I'm gonna put you guys down. And now with that loosened, uh, you're gonna wanna grab some pliers and you're going to want to disconnect this. This hose here on the blow off valve or bypass valve, it just pops off. Nice and easy. There we are. Grab some pliers, disconnect that, and you'll be good to go. And then simply pop this hose off. It is cold out, so everything's a little tricky to get off. There we go. There's that. And then, now you should loosen this clamp. Now, like I said, this is an absolute pain to get this coupler off and I may need to remove it in order to get the intercooler out. I haven't tried before, but here we go. Okay, that went a lot harder than it should have. <laughs> I've had this intercooler off so many times, but it got caught up on this secondary hose. So, Let's just move this off to the side, and this is why I am going to be replacing it. Because she's a leaky, leaky, leaky. There we go. So, let's get the new one unboxed. We do have a few hoses. Oh, sorry guys. We have a few hoses there to disconnect. And now with these, you wanna go one at a time just so that you don't get mixed up. That one's easy, but yeah, we'll do that. So I just got the new intercooler unboxed and immediately disappointed. This hose is completely busted. Uh, I was hoping to use new hoses, the new hoses. Um, this looks good, a lot better. Then we flip it over gently. And all these fins are mangled. The paint is chipped off here. Uh, paint's chipped off here. But it, mine didn't have this on it, so that's, that's just the cover though. I mean, 
four screws and boom. <sighs> so, uh, I'm gonna swap over everything. And yeah, there is a new, a new bypass valve as well, so no need to worry about that. So let's flip this back over gently and let's get these this one pulled off this one seems to be okay it's a little a little stiff but it should be okay so let's pop this one off then okay so we got the new I got the new cooler and uh, putting it in wasn't all that bad actually I just made sure that this was lined up nice a little wiggling to get that in and a little wiggling oops to get that clamp in so now and unfortunately, I wasn't expecting this to be separate, this bypass valve separate. So unfortunately, I don't have a gasket for it, but I will, as soon as I get into work on Monday, I will order one. So let's just pop that off. <clears throat> so the issue that I was having, um, I would be okay idling, I would be okay before two grand, but as soon as I hit two grand, it would start smoking like crazy and it would just bog down. You unplug the mass airflow sensor and it would run and drive fine, but you still felt a little bit of bogging. So like not, not as bad as it was, it was 100% more drivable, but just between the switch over when that, when Leaky McLeaky here um, was opening up to allow the second turbo or whatever it was, I can't quite remember how this system works, but whenever that was functioning, I think it was leaking. Yeah. Anyways, so that was the issue I was having. Hopefully this intercooler solves it. Not too happy about the condition. Uh, I'm gonna have to talk to the guys that sold it to me. Unfortunately, when you import a vehicle, this is what you have to deal with. Um, if this was like a WRX or an STI, it would be no problem. But because this is the rare uh, twin turbo EJ20 or EJ208, um, it's a revision D. Problem is with that, we never got this motor here in Canada. So because of that, I have to get everything pretty much from Japan or local uh, importers are able to find these parts and you're kind of, you know, you're left to their own devices. Um, what you get what is what you get. So anyways, and um, not too happy about it, but it should be okay. It shouldn't be leaking. If it does, probably what I'll end up doing is I'll just swap out that core. Um, with this, I'll pull all the pipes off of this one, and I like that. <laughs> I like the STI plate on it. So this probably came out of an S401, if I had to guess, or the previous owner put an STI sticker on it, but I have a feeling this came out of an S401, uh, which is cool, I guess. So let's pop the bypass valve on. I've plugged in the mass airflow sensor, uh, button up those two bolts, and see what we get. All right, and there we are. We're all buttoned up. I've plugged the mass airflow sensor back in. Let's start it up. That's all good, that's all connected. Okay. And if anybody knows where I can get one of these, aside from buying bulk silicone and cutting it myself, it's at a very weird angle. If anyone can tell me where I can find one of these, please let me know in the comments because I could use one. So let's start it up, see what happens, see if it does it. Okay, I'm just gonna turn everything off. Let's start it. Check engine light, of course, is off now because of the mass airflow sensor being plugged in. She's a little smoky. Maybe it was some garbage in that intercooler. I'm just going to let it kind of 
work its way out. There, it's smoothing out now, so maybe there was a little bit of oil in that intercooler left over. Okay, the idle is smooth now. That's good. Not smoking like it was. I just want to let the revs come down, let it come out of open loop or cold start. And plus I want to get the uh, oil to, the, I want to get oil to those turbos before I start giving it some revs. So the idle is just coming down. Let's see what we got here. It's currently seven degrees Celsius, so it is a little bit cool today, and that's why it's taking its sweet time getting down. But let's just, uh, okay, force it down. Still doing it. Smoking. Right around 35, right there. But now, turn it off. Turn that off, because that's annoying. Unplug the mass airflow sensor. Obviously now the check engine light is on, but no problem. All right, I'm gonna have to keep trying. And I thought I would mention, because I know you're gonna say it, replace the mass airflow sensor. I have replaced it three times. I've replaced it with a Denso, I've replaced it with a Bremi, and this is a genuine Subaru mass airflow sensor from a WRX, and it's still not doing it. I mean, it's still not fixing it. Everyone had their own little funky issues. The Bremi didn't want to idle, but it drove great. The Denso, actually the Denso that was in it, that's why I replaced it and why I've been fighting all these stupid issues. The Denso that was in it was just being stupid and it wasn't idling, there was no power, nothing. So I replaced it with the Bremi. Bremi idled, but it, uh, I'm sorry, it wouldn't idle very well. It wanted to quit. You'd take it out for a drive, it would drive like a bat out of hell. But as soon as you would come to a stop sign, put your foot on the clutch, it would die. Now the genuine Subaru, everything works okay. It idles great, but as you saw, you get around 3000 RPM, 3500 RPM, and it just craps out. I don't know. I'm gonna keep looking here. So let's continue on, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.